Welcome to Support Life, a program focusing on current social issues from a life-affirming perspective. I'm Gavin Bolch, and my guest is Ken Francis. He's from the Australian Family Association. Ken, welcome. Gavin, it's lovely to be here with you. I'm just wondering who's uh, up tonight. Uh, my insomniac friends um, are looking in and they're meeting you. And uh, your life began on the farm? Yes, well, in a Partially, but within the hotels business and, in, and on the farm, we've always had a farm. Uh, even as a young child, we lived in the hotel, but we had the farm and I was very attracted to that lifestyle and uh, wanted to, always wanted to be a farmer, to be very honest, yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and you had some big dreams? Oh, big dream, biggest, oh yes, I'm a big dreamer. Um, much to my wife's uh, dismay sometimes, but she, she was, you know, but we did. We dreamed big and uh, hope to have a very good farm, a profitable farm one day. Okay, and it was mixed? Yes, uh, we were always looked at sheep, we love sheep, would you believe, cattle, and uh, cropping if that was appropriate, you know, wherever, wherever we ended up, yes. yes. So what acreage did you have at the time? Well, when we finally got our own place was um, 2,000 uh, acres or about 800 odd hectares. and. Uh, but that was the culmination. We, we had farmed on smaller properties, on the family f property, and uh, before that, and uh, that, that, was, uh, that was interesting and a developmental phase for me, yes, that was okay. right. So that was at Balan? Yes, eventually we were at Balan, but we were at Romsey before that, and uh, moved across about uh, 40 kilometres across to, to Balan and moved into a, a community and uh, found lovely friends there and, um, and it was a very, very exciting time for us, yeah. yeah. Ken, a farmer has to depend on circumstances uh, and situations beyond his control. What, what's that like? Well, it's a, it actually can be a little, fairly stressful because, you know, you think, oh, a farmer is idyllic, you know, the birds are flying around, the bees are making butter and, you know, and, and so on, but no, it's tough. and. Um, in a sense, uh, it's a great life, but it's a tough one. You depend on the rain, you depend on the, the, the weather, and, and it's your, you can have wet sheep, or you can have things that be too dry for a crop, and so on. So it's always something out there that's beyond your control, uh, Gavin, yeah, that's, that's what happens, yeah. And um, so you went through, through a hard spell? Yes, we had a hard spell, we had a drought, and um, ended up uh, f feeding our sheep uh, by hand and uh, because there was not a blade of grass in the, on the paddocks. It's just uh, amazing. You can't think that it can happen. But the, what grass might be there was blown away and the winds were hot and dry. And so anyway, that was what we did. So we ran into that drought and we, uh, we sort of toughed it through it and um, the family held together and uh, we were able to eventually um, move out of the farming because that was the it could, we could see the writing on the wall and, and we were, took jobs off the farm and it was a, you know a tough time but it was an exciting time too. Yeah. yeah. So there would have been farmers though around you who succumbed um, yes. to that pressure. And yes. Yeah. Tragically, uh, there, there was, an, and to my knowledge, a number even in a in a favourable area that, that succumbed to this and uh, committed suicide. Um, and that, that's so sad, it's so tragic, and, and yet you, you know, so many of us were sort of were fighting on, but it, it was the support, I think, that we, we ourselves received, or that, 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 and from the Lord, and from also from the family and friends and, and all that, that makes the difference, I think, yes. Yeah, so. Yes. Now, um, you went back into the hotel industry? Yes, we are in the hotels all through this, so that was uh, quite good from an income point of view, it helped us. Um, and then eventually I found work outside the, um, the f farming uh, business and that was in the area of unemployment and training, uh, and which I worked with a lot of several um, councils, uh, municipal councils uh, who had training programs going and I was able to move across into that area and found that very fruitful in the long, long term, yes. So why was that so encouraging, actually? What was the experiences you were having? Well, here we, here we were with uh, our own family growing up, and of course, and, and entering, preparing to enter into the workforce themselves. On the other hand, you had at those times a, a substantial youth unemployment problem and uh, recognised it all by the state governments and the federal government. And, and so these uh, training programs were developed and, and uh, under what they called Skillshare in those days. And uh, we were able to um, 
uh, develop special programs according to the local needs mm -hmm. of, the, of the young people. Some might have been horticulture or gardening, that mm -hmm. type ones. It may have been um, uh, computers and IT in general. And um, and the the beauty of all that was that these young people were coming forward and we were they wanted a job mm -hmm. and they were prepared to train and, and put in their time. and. Um, so we were prepared to, and, and, and impressed really, and, and wonderful to stand by them and to give them an op opportunity for their own uh, yes. endeavours, yes. Yeah. So one of the positive sides there was the fact that they, they were willing, they were enthusiastic to get on with life. They were, they were indeed, and it was uh, wonderful to see it, you know, and, uh, and not only young, but uh, some older women, women returning to the workforce were the same, in the same category, and uh, people were giving it a go and prepared to come and, and stand up and, and, and say, all right, Ken and my staff, we'll, we'll be there, we'll give it a go. If you, and we're, we, we were only pleased and proud, I think, to be able to support them in that, yeah. Yes. yes. Now, um, behind every good man, every successful man is a good woman. Mm -hmm. So tell me some of the story of your good late wife. Well, my wife Lorraine was uh, a wonderful person and um, she, um, when this drought struck her, she was a trained teacher and um, a primary teacher, but she had to then move into new territory on her own account and uh, took a job as a teacher, classroom teacher initially, but then she became a principal of a small school, took on further training herself, went down to the Deakin University, and um, she then graciously moved through some schools and into a, a principal of a very large school and, um, and where she's well remembered even to this day, yes. Thank you, Ken, for that snippet on uh, Lorraine's life. You're watching Support Life and we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Support Life, I'm Gavin Bolch and my guest is Ken Francis from the Australian Family Association. Ken, we were just uh, talking about your wife and this is the sixth anniversary uh, of her passing and uh, she's left a, a legacy. Uh, tell me about the children and grandchildren, what's happening there? Well, Gavin, yes, we have a lovely family of four, three, uh, three boys and a, a, a daughter and 11 grandchildren and they are scattered a little bit throughout the world but we're very proud of them and they've given us a lot of pleasure. We have um, a family in Vietnam and a Vietnamese daughter-in-law for example. We have a family in Brisbane and three and um, Point Lonsdale three and Melbourne two. So that's, that's the, the sum total now and uh, we're, she's very much very close to our hearts of course on this day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, well, we, we've talked about your good wife, but your mother had some input regarding an incident um, at the hotel. What? what yes, what yes. Was that? It's interesting, Gavin. I, uh, these thoughts came back to me um, just recently, but my, Gav uh, my um, mother herself, when she was only a young woman, let's say probably late 20s, uh, she uh, took a uh, drunk home, and I was only a kid, and you know, and I was sort of terrified for her safety. And uh, but it wasn't a dangerous situation, but uh, I, it it struck me, and been un I think with me subconsciously for all these years that uh, a, a work of love and charity can, you know, even you know, even an unappealing sort of job uh, work can 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 be there, and it. I, I, I've been inspired by that, to be very honest, yes. yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. that level of, of compassion, sort of Christ's compassion, yes. being evidenced before you. Right there, and uh, you know, you don't understand things, but you see things. And uh, so I suppose it's been in, in both my wife and my life to, to try and assist. I think if you try and assist people who are in, in trouble, well, you know, it's, that's, that's our job. That's, yes. that's what we're there for. Yes as well as our family, well as our friends, there's other people out there in the world. And, yeah. So life is precious, right? Yes. H how does that translate in your life? I mean, it's a phrase, life is precious. So do you do something about that? Yes, we've been over the years to see that this whole question of, of life and um, how, where it is threatened and um, you know, and the issues of abortion and euthanasia now are very prominent. And what do we say? What do we do about this? If you feel strongly, if I feel strongly, what do I do? 
And um, so it's been a, a question of trying to argue the case for for life in, in the political arena and in the social arena. And, and um, wherever we can, we've just tried to argue that, look, let's look, let life go on. Don't, don't, don't prejudice life, yes. Now, that's um, had you on a few uh, what we call walk for the babies. Yes. Walk. So tell me about that. Well, the Walk for the Babies has been going for five years now, especially, but it's followed on from a, a, a whole history of march and walks for the for life um, over the last 40 years even. And these um, events uh, carry on and they're the demonstration of the political side of, of people who are not content to have um, wholesale uh, abortion, just to draw people's attention gently to the fact that babies deserve life. They deserve to have a go, support the babies, support life, and um, take just just create awareness. We don't want to blame anyone. We don't want to point the finger. We just want to say, let life go on. Let life go on. Mm. Yeah. So raising the children, and, and of course, you actually, as a grandparent, raising grandchildren, your, your influence on them when they come visit. Mm. Um, how are you finding that role? Well, the grandparent role is, is a sort of amazing one. Um, it's not as, as obvious that you can do a lot. Or, you know, the parents, their kids' parents will look after them and do many things for them, but you can only love them, I think, you, you know, um, and you can only show that you can, you in your turn have loved your, their mother, the boys and girls' mother, and that they hope that they look after their own partners and love their own partners and, and wives and husbands and gee if you can be unconditional that's the tough one but we try to be unconditional we try to be reach out to them and, and live a life you know i think that, that that maybe one day they might say that's worth that's worth following you know so i'm making an assumption here but like yeah, your mother's experience with the drunk and the compassion mm. that she mm. showed mm. that your children picked up on the fact that on the farm you were caring for uh, young mothers so that they didn't have to adopt their children out. Yes, and, and that was a great a great work on behalf of particularly my wife's place because the, she was with the giving counselling to un, un, married, un single mothers in those days and the, the life of a single mother in, in, in the time in those years ago wasn't all that easy because there wasn't the, quite the support that is of now. And the tendency was, you know, again, facing choices that the women would face, these young women who didn't have a partner, who didn't have that support, who didn't have that encouragement, and perhaps their own families were not, you know, were not that supportive either. So these women were quite often on their own, and um, so to take them in through the um, Carolyn Chisholm Society in those days, counselling on the one hand, but also then the ones who needed a home for a short term to come to grips with this pregnancy, and, and then uh, whatever uh, whatever fell them their babies and themselves in the future was another was something beyond us. But we, you know, it's only a matter of being in support, being encouraging. Yes, and there have been occasions when um, some of those children uh, of the mothers have made contact with you. What, what, what's that like? Yes, that's very heartening. And uh, to have, have that happen um, is it's, it's, it's heart-rending, actually. And um, so we have the situation where um, the children or the, of these young people have come and they're, they're mourning my, my wife as well. And, and they, they will ring up on occasion and say, Ken, we're thinking of her, we remember her. Wow. Well, that's, that's quite something. Mm, yeah. um, moved to this unemployment, mm. um, caring for mm. young adults. Mm. Um, how do you think things are today? Gavin, things are tough today. Uh, let's be clear about this. My personal view, while I'm not professionally involved these days, um, it, it re there is a lot of unemployment, there's a lot of underemployment, and it is difficult. And we have n industries moving out, we have industries closing up wholesale, and uh, particularly, say, manufacturing, which is of interest to me, and, and the, the employment of young men, and women, of course, too. But 
and trade, you know. So, so this, there is a, it's, it is a difficult scene. And I, um, you know, would only hope that we can, as a community, begin to mobilise to create the work, create the training. And I know that the young people are, are brilliant. They were full of life like they always have been. And um, they'll be there. But uh, I think as a community, we need to be more serious about this and really give it a, a chance, give them a chance to uh, pick up and get them get them out into the workforce and uh, yeah ken thank you for those comments you're watching support life and we'll be back after the break welcome back to support life i'm gavin bolch and my guest is ken francis from the australian family association ken we were talking before and we came across a phrase uh, humble inquiry. Let's unpackage that a little bit. Well, Gavin, while I'm no expert on a humble inquiry, I found it a very powerful tool where a person involved in, a, in an issue or a problem uh, can seek the input of other people, of, 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 of other participants in the, in the question. So instead of me, Ken, coming up and saying, I know what this problem is, the humble inquiry will enable us to sort it out, to, to tease it out, to um, and perhaps come up with a different question um, or a wider question or a more fundamental approach to whatever the issue might be, whether it's unemployment or it's, it's uh, life issues or, or what have you. And a very, I find a very powerful tool. So uh, behind it is this desire to just slow down not to take knee-jerk reactions to the circumstance or the half knowledge that we have about something? I think so, yes. Fundamentally, that's true. Um, for example, I tend to be attack things like a bull at a gate, you know. And until I could realise that, no, let us slow down, let us explore, and let us explore other people's uh, input to this issue. Now, whether it's uh, an organisational issue, maybe in a business even, or it may be a job description or an, a number of other applications, uh, the humble inquiry enables the, uh, the uh, person involved, say for example myself in a job and reviewing that job, a, a person to tease out some of the issues about the job, uh, my reaction to what I'm asked to do, mm -hmm. And then we have a little panel of uh, some peers and, and people who can tease out then my reaction, for example, and, uh, and, and make observations. And uh, so it's a, it is, it's a gentle, but powerful thing, not threatening either. Okay, so uh, there's an old uh, Hebrew word, um, shalom, it sort of brings peace hmm. into the discussion or the debate hmm. uh, or the heated moment mm -hmm. uh, that might be there. Hmm. Yes. So it, it is a question of being peaceful, I think, yes, of being open uh, and open to the spirit uh, to, to inform, inform the participants. And, uh, and while we don't have to, we can still be robust and ro rigorous about what we say, it, it is done in a, in, in a, in a, a feeling of, of, of participation, but also opening up the, any discussion to several points of view, to, to other dimensions, not just the, the one, the self. You know, yes. yeah. Our uh, Aboriginal Indigenous nation um, has a saying, is walk a while with me. Uh, so we do need to slow down our pace and we do need to be less political in terms of the aggression because uh, we're not going to hear the full story and we're not going to ask the right questions. No, and I think this is question of asking the right question is, is probably the nub of, of many problems because my view of something is not necessarily the only view, even though I'm very confident about it. Um, but other people react then. If I ask a question or make a statement about a tactic or a strategy of something in nature, for example, Others would, can be threatened, or they may be supportive of it, but we're not delving into their approach to this same problem. Yeah. Now, uh, again, in life, um, working hard, marriage, having children, raising them, grandchildren, uh, the full gamut is that 
others rub off on us and we have to learn these other skills or seek mm. the Lord for grace to be patient, mm. um, embracing, long-suffering, mm. uh, show compassion and goodness. Mm. Yes. Um, where are we today? It's 2014 and we've got the March for the Babies. Yes. What would you say to the watching audience? Look, I'd say let's, let us be open. I think open to uh, to to ideas, in, in, to open to argument. Now, I've, for example, on this life issue, we've taken it to the political sphere, and 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 we've taken it to social sphere, and the, the whole discussion. But there is of, there's often the question then of, oh no, we ignore it. We ignore the hard questions, and and I, I think these days we must be prepared to gently be be true true to our own conscience too and and to have conscience and reason and and inform our politics and of course that's that's a big thing these days because often we hear oh no we don't want the religious view in the public arena we don't, in the public square and uh, no that's not good enough anymore we are all informed we with conscience and we all have the capacity to reason but let's let's be able to bring it out let's not have some voices cut out of the discussions, yeah. yeah. Um, I liked uh, the writings and uh, artistry of G.K. Chesterton. Mm. Um, if any who are watching, uh, just do a bit of research. He was a person who wrote poetry, plays, mm. um, cartoons. He was quick-witted. Um, he would debate. Mm. Uh, he was willing just to explore mm. the other avenues to connect people one to the other and discuss issues yes. and it would be wonderful I think if we, if we could have that in the media today or in the in the, even in uh, public uh, in public discussions even to have our uh, speakers heard and, and it's just a, a very sad tendency now for people to drown out people, voices they do not wish to hear yes and yes. that's 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 not, it's not a reflection on our democracy no. at all no. Uh, now often what happens is that um, the relationship isn't deep enough to take a hard question and we dismiss the other. Uh, we, we don't remain friends like we used to. No, and uh, quite often I, I think the, the uh, archetype of all that, of course, is Thomas More. I, when he was threatened with being, having his head cut off by the king, he said, I am the king's good friend, but God's first. And um, I think if you can keep your friendship going while well, they're threatening someone to cut your head off uh, this shows you there's something big and there's something big behind it yes well i just thank you for your time uh, ken today and uh, you've been watching support life and that's all for our program today join us again next week goodbye <music>